Obviously, I love the Mega Man X games. If you know me at all, that's not a surprising fact. It's even less surprising if you know the games because they rule, even if the series starts to fizzle out by the end of its eight installments. But out of the first four X games, there was one that I didn't obsessively play when I was younger, and that's Mega Man X3, which I honestly still feel pretty much neutral towards. But is that because I have no nostalgia for it, because I'm a cold-hearted bastard, or just because the game itself is totally inconsiderate towards completionists like me? Hey everyone, and welcome to an all-new episode of the Completionist New Game Plus, where I am re-completing the original 120 games that I have featured here on the channel. Look, I've spent a lot of time in my life playing, talking, and thinking about Mega Man, especially Mega Man X. I've made a lot of videos on the guy, and when I originally covered Mega Man X3, I didn't have a ton to say because at the time, it was easily my least favorite of the first four games in the series. And you know what? It still is. And it's fine if I take some heat for it. I'm fine with it. But even though it's not the game that I love, I'm still excited to unpack it, possibly even with the help of a surprise guest. Who, you might ask? I'm not telling, because that's literally what the word surprise means. Get ready, here we go. knows that the first two Mega Man X games are awesome. They were the grittier, much more 90s alternative to the classic Mega Man games. And I played them a lot. The gameplay was classic Mega Man with a few cool new additions. They looked great, and they had rad new characters like the laser sword wielding Zero, who is exactly as awesome as anyone named Zero is contractually obligated to be. But for whatever reason, I skipped Mega Man X3 as a kid and went straight to X4, where Zero is fully playable as a character. Which means I missed all the hype of his appearance in X3, where he was playable for the very first time. He's that dope dude from the first two, with the laser sword who basically shows up just to illustrate how much cooler X could be and will be by the end of the game. And this was the first time where players actually got to take him for a test drive. Is that an offensive way to talk about a robot? As soon as I said it, I felt really bad. X3 also has become one of the most expensive and hard to find games in the series, especially the SNES version, which is actually what I played both times, because it was before the Legacy Collection came out just a couple years ago. Mega Man X did come right at the tail end of the SNES's life cycle, with the 32-bit version also being released on the Sega Saturn and PlayStation. So maybe that's part of why it fell through the cracks for me, and I ended up getting around to it so late. But when I finally did end up getting around to it, it didn't really make an impression on me like the first two did. Not because it was particularly bad or anything, because it's not, but there's nothing that really pops. The story, the gameplay, the level design, it's all fine, but none of it really clicked for me. So when I revisit a Mega Man X game, it doesn't usually end up being this one. Now these games aren't necessarily known for their stories, but even this one does benefit from the cool world the first two games set up. Mankind still lives alongside robots known as Reploids, some of which love to do crimes and are known as Mavericks. When a scientist known as Dr. Doppler claims to have found a way to reform Mavericks, and by proxy establishes a utopia, it's only a matter of time before they revert to their robo-criminal ways, and Maverick Hunters X and Zero are sent in to do something about it. Alright, so the gameplay still revolves around classic Mega Man stuff like jumping, shooting, and jumping while shooting, along with the X staples like dashing, wall jumping, and charging up the shots. There's also an incredible emphasis on those big suits of armor that X can drive around in, along with specific sections of the game where Zero can be called in to substitute for X for a little bit. And yes, there are animal-themed mavericks to defeat, each of whom has a related weapon that's strong against a specific other boss. It feels very much like a Mega Man X game, but just slightly off. I don't know, I still can't fully explain it. But I'm sure our special guest will show up soon to help me try. You should definitely be hyped about who it is, and it almost certainly won't turn out to be an intentionally unsatisfying moment that will help me illustrate a point about this game. With games as short as the Mega Man X games, completion isn't usually something that I'm overly worried about. But completing Mega Man X3 actually punishes you for playing the game a certain way, and makes the overall process considerably less fun, which only adds to this game's weird haphazard vibes. So it's a staple of these games that X will fight a series of goofy, animal-themed robots, and I've always been down with that. Same goes for playing them all in a certain order, to make sure that I had the best weapon for each boss. But this is the first time for me in the X series where I remember thinking that the bosses were a little 
too ridiculous. Or rather, it might be the fact that this is where the design started to feel as lazy as the names. Because I don't automatically have a problem with robots named Volt Catfish or Toxic Seahorse, but the animal themed villains from the previous games had cool designs to go along with the goofy names. But when I look at Volt Catfish, I just kind of feel nothing. Like yeah, that's a Volt Catfish alright. But I have no opinions beyond that, which is in stark contrast to how I feel about the characters in the other games. Same goes for the story, which is very rote, you know, beat the bad guy type stuff, which is fine. But it feels very disconnected from the others, and neither like the end of one trilogy or the beginning of a new one. And spoiler alert, but even when Sigma does come back as the main villain, it's just like, yeah, sure, of course he does, it's Mega Man, you get it. The level design ends up being alright, but it's telling that both times I've played this game, I've used guides because the levels don't compel me to obsessively learn every inch of them like I wanted to in the other X games. Yes, that could be a byproduct of the fact that I have no real nostalgia for this game and I first completed it for the show, but I don't think so. In fact, I think if it's a byproduct of anything at all, it's of this game's approach to completion, which put me off even more this time around than it did the first time. There are two major examples of this, and I'll start with the enhancement chips. The regular armor upgrades still work just like they do in previous games, found in blue Dr. Light capsules hidden throughout the levels. But there are also pink capsules, which allow X to equip one of four armor chips. But he's only to have one equipped at a time, which wouldn't be a big deal if there weren't a fifth capsule containing the hyper chip, which grants the benefits of all four chips at once, but can't be unlocked if you've gotten any of the previous four chips. The game literally punishes you for trying to get everything by taking the coolest of the upgrades off the table, just for wanting to actually participate in one of the game's major systems. And I get the idea that the hyper chip is a reward for passing up the others, but wouldn't it make it more sense to reward the player for actually getting them all? Unlocking the ability to use more than one chip at once is great, but there's absolutely no reason it needs to come with a weird ultimatum attached. Hey, I'm the completionist, right? I want to find all the stuff, that's my whole deal. And it's very weird when a game actually punishes me for doing that. So completing this game actually meant avoiding these pink capsules and missing out on extra abilities throughout my playthrough, just so I could still get the hyper chip to use in the last couple of levels. As the years have gone on, I've only grown to find this more annoying, but it's still nothing compared to the way the game handles its other major new feature, which actually brings us to our special guest, who is here to tell us all about it, Alex Fossiani. Take it away, brother. Hey, everyone. In Mega Man X3, Alex? Alex, where'd you go? Huh. Oh. I guess he can never come back. Ever. Again. It was as if we had him here for five seconds, and now he's gone. I cannot reach him. Cool. That feels bad, right? That just because of a small mistake, we'll never know what Alex had to say about this game? Well, guess what? That's exactly what this game does with Zero. Treating it like a big deal that he's finally a playable character, and then pulling back from actually encouraging the player to take part in the game's coolest feature. Because there are certain areas in which Zero is playable, but it still doesn't really feel like the levels are designed with him in mind. He has a slower movement speed and a much larger hitbox, and oh, oh yeah, if he dies even once, he's just gone forever. Because that's a cool feature, right? That super cool laser sword robot you've been wanting to beat for the last two games? Yeah, he just fell into some spikes and whoops, death is permanent, the world is sad, and I guess there's nothing we can do about it. it still kind of pisses me off, especially because later games you just play as Zero without getting all weird about it. And because Zero is awesome, but this game makes him feel not awesome, because the ending changes depending on whether or not he's alive, and the game's biggest unlockable is also tied to him, which means that if you want a specific ending, or the super secret bonus weapon, then actually using him in levels just isn't worth the risk. Oops, sorry about that. But just like it's not fair that Alex can't reappear because I've arbitrarily decided he can't, this game's approach to completion actually forced me to refuse to participate in some of the cooler parts of the game. I obviously still wanted to find all of the heart tanks and sub tanks, because I am the completionist after all, but this haha -ha, just kidding approach to completion is a big part of the reason why I still don't find this game all the interesting or fun to explore. I'll still collect everything that I can and fight all the secret bosses because of course I will, but completion is about a sense of discovery, which this game seems to get off on withholding from the player at every step of the process. It was a bummer when I finally got around to the game and it's still a bummer now. So maybe I made the right call by skipping it as a kid and saving myself the trouble. Yes, that's definitely the takeaway here everyone, that I am a genius who initially skipped this game for a reason, and not just because it slipped through the cracks. Yep, definitely the take.
There is one major unlockable in this game, just like with the Shoryuken and Haruken in previous games, and it's tied to Zero like I talked about before. Now normally you can't play as him for mini bosses, but there's one specifically in Doppler's Fortress that, if you beat him as Zero, initiates a cutscene where X shows up. Then Zero's power source gets all jacked up, so Zero gives X his beam saber and then pieces out for the rest of the game. Admittedly, this is a much cooler way to lose access to Zero, because you at least get a beam saber out of it. And if it were the only way to lose Zero permanently, I might even be pretty into it. But when he passes off the saber to X and then vanishes, it just once again raises the question of why he's even playable in this game. And getting to use the saber as X is very dope. It is super powerful, and it goes a little bit towards the promise of playing as Zero, but it doesn't have that cool super secret easter egg feeling of something like the Street Fighter moves did from the first two games. But I don't know, it might be my nostalgia getting in my own way, it's whatever, it's fine, but mildly disappointing to me personally, like everything else about this game. But it was once again a very short overall experience though, so my irritation didn't last very long. And there are plenty of other great Mega Man X games I can jump into whenever I need to scratch that specific itch, but this is still probably never going to be one of them. Let me be clear, Mega Man X3 is not a bad Mega Man X game. Out of the original trilogy, it's just my least favorite. It's still Mega Man X though, and while I may have missed the boat of this installment the first time around, my subsequent two experiences with it makes me feel like, hey, maybe that's okay. When I re-completed Mega Man X3, there were three deaths, because I still don't know this game all that well as the others that I've been playing basically my whole life. Eight hard tanks and four sub tanks collected along with four armor upgrades and one hyper chip in place of the four enhancement chips. I still think overall this is a little convoluted and dumb, but the armor upgrades are always nice. Eight wacky themed animal bosses defeated, not counting other non-animal bosses like Vile and Sigma. Farewell, Crush Crawfish. I'll never forget you. Actually, I definitely have forgotten you since the last time, but I can't promise that, so I'm sorry, Crush Crawfish. Around two hours of total playtime, which is a very small amount, but noticeably more than the other X games, because I've never really ended up caring enough to know the level super well. And Zero, who should rightfully be the coolest part of this game, but somehow isn't. At least he has a name that's a number though, so I can include him in the breakdown. That's kind of convenient, I guess. You know, I'm kind of sad that I don't have the affection for this game that I do for so many other of the X games, but I guess that's just the way that it is. Maybe I missed out, or maybe this doesn't click with me, but I don't know, I'm... Oh, sorry, one sec. Yeah, that was Alex. He's still mad. He's mad that we'll let him come back. And you know what? He should be, because that's the way that this game treats Zero, and that's dumb, and I stand by it. But hey, if you love Mega Man X, and you have the collection of these games, there's no reason not to give it at least a couple hours of your time. So, with that in mind, guys, I give this game my completionist rating of... Finish it. Finish it!